brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Only One Mike Podcast called Gerard Brooklyn Dre. J. Rob is off tonight. But listen, y'all, we got a very, very special, special guest in the house. This brother here is an award-winning cinematographer, a life coach, a motivational speaker, and so much more. Mr. Brian Isom. How you doing, brother? Yo, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Yeah, we was we was talking behind the scenes, y'all. And, you know, he was saying about talking about balance, man. Like, if, you know, the energy just came off the brother. Like, you know, he got everything lined up the right way, man. So, um, I just I just wanted to say once again, thank you for coming on. Talk to Lacrest, big shout, Lacrest, always helping us up with some good people, good people. Right. And, I love um, Lacrest. Yeah, right, right. yeah, man. And so. When she reached out to me and said, I got this brother here, real positive, might be good to be on the show, or whatever. I'm like, all right, absolutely. I looked at your bio. I said, yeah, get the brother on. We're going to slide him on here and let him talk to our people. You know what I mean? You know, so hopefully oh, yeah. uh, we, we learn something from one another. So um, listen, uh, you got so much on your plate, man, on your resume here with the cinematography, a war winning cinematographer, a producer. Uh, can you name some of the shows that you did? I know you did like a lot of the, the courtroom uh, right. Shows well, I started off in Hollywood when I left uh, uh, the military. I, I left Iraq and I manifested going to Hollywood. I was in Alabama. I'm an Alabama native. Okay. And uh, uh, some of the shows that I did, so the first show I did come home from Iraq was We the People with Gloria Allred. I was a bailer. So to come home from <laughs> as a soldier and then it's like, yo, I got a security job on TV and my first acting gig. Right, right. I mean, it, it was a blessing. And then from there, that was under the production of Byron Allen. Oh, mm, okay. And Byron is an Allen Media um, Entertainment Studios, is yes. what it's called. And Byron, lovely brother. Oh, I love Byron. Byron said, he knew I had just came back from Iraq. He says, young man, he says, what else can I do for you? I see you're doing good things. How else can I serve you? I said, whoa. Wow. I said, Wow. Well, me? I said, right. man, I want to do some more camera and more acting. He said, consider it done. And it was done. Mm. And, um, and and then from there, um, he allowed me to be the only, I was the only black camera operator on sitcoms that he did. Oh, wow. wow. So I got to work with Vivica Fox, Rick Fox, Bill Bellamy, um, Essence Atkins, uh, John Witherspoon. Oh, wow. Uh, that was the homie. I've never met it. Anybody so authentic. You know, he's a comedian. But to be around an individual that was so himself, like I was at his house, it was just me and him. And he was just the same way as he would be on TV. He mm. had a, I'll tell you a quick, I'll tell you a quick story. He had a neck brace on. And um, I said, he had came to set. It was a sitcom. And uh and uh, I said, John, what happened to that? I said, you had a neck brace on when you came to set. I said, what was up with that? He said, Brian, he said, I was, uh, he said, I was talking to my agent and I was trying to put my pants leg on. And he said, I, and I didn't want to let the phone go. And I, and I almost, <laughs> and I was like, yo. <laughs> and it was just me and him yeah, at, the, at the table just talking. And he was just so authentic. And it was just a, a, a breath of fresh air to just be around an authentic individual. Yeah. You especially know, in, but, that, in that space of uh, uh, being in Hollywood, I reckon, you know, um, you don't meet too many authentic people, you know what I mean? No. Plus, he's naturally no. funny, man. You know, he's he's naturally funny, man. Anything he does, it's just a regular conversation. It's just hilarious, you know. I was a student just watching him read the script, mm. and I was a camera operator, and I would be like watching him uh, read, and I'm like, "Hey, he's doing his lines wrong." No, he was doing the lines right. He was doing them his way, but I was trying to keep up. I was like, "Oh, I didn't know you could do, you could say a line like that." And, I was like, wow, you know, and so to see him at work in his mastery and Jack A. Harry, you know, to see her and her, um, you know, just perform. And I was like, wow, I was, I was watching. And what I was doing, I was collecting data just to take back home to Alabama to do my own things, you know, do my own sitcoms, my own television shows. But um, 
Uh, so the so the projects that I've been able been blessed to work on, I worked on like like six of Byron Allen's court shows, the stage managing uh, judges from Judge Ross, Judge Karen, Judge Christina Perez, um, Judge Maybelline. Mm. Uh, I was sta- I was behind the scenes stage managing. I never said no to anything that was asked of me because I knew I was learning and I wanted that knowledge to learn as much as I could. Uh, so I could, you know, take it back home to the South and, and build another empire, you know. Yeah, and that's, so, that's uh, good that he was yeah. influential in, in, in your career. Did you have, like, prior camera work experience, or he just put you out there and said, yo, go learn it? Oh, I was going to film school at the same time. At it was a blessing. Time. Okay. At the oh. same time, getting on the, on the job, he allowed me my first experience, my first camera job, to be on a sitcom. He trusted me. I was the only black. And mm. so some of the actors rarely see black camera guys i would think behind the camera especially young like i was and they was like like they would all come over to the camera and tease me but um i was in film school while i was working for byron on those sitcoms like didn't have to like start from the ground up as a camera boy Mm. camera assistant and it was like it was gifted to me Mm. and i and i took it as a gift and i said i'm gonna run with this it's kind of awesome you know um do you think that uh, mil- the military had anything to do with, like, you know, um, you know, the opportunities that were presented to you? I mean, because, you know, I was in the service, too. So I don't know if um, you've experienced it, but it's almost like some sort of a glow that you have off of you when you come out of the military. You know, I don't, I don't know if maybe I had it before I went to the military. But, you know, you know what I mean? When people just seem like it just opens up a world of things for you. You know what? The military... It does. I think we already have something, but the military enhances who we already are. It heightens it. And the leadership that when you're in the military and you're rising through the ranks, you have to go to, you know, to leadership school, right? Right. So in that in that leadership school, having to do public speaking, give courses and be in front of people and, and uh, be heard. I think that prepped me for that moment mm-hmm. when I worked with Byron Allen because they saw leadership skills within me i went from a camera position to like a stage manager overnight because they they saw and and i never said no i was like it's a new role um i know i I wanted to do camera because that's what i was going to film school for for cinematography and so i was like i will turn nothing down i will graciously and gratefully accept everything so yes the military played a pivotal a pivotal role in uh my success uh, working on television sets uh, because mm-hmm. of the discipline and the leadership uh, that the army provided. Plus, I think the one thing they instilled in me too, and I, I may have had it before I went there, but um, I think, you know, definitely after I got it is like the job is going to get done no matter what happens. You know what I mean? I'm going to, you know, there ain't going to be no complaining. We're going to get it done. You know, exactly. You know how, you know exactly. I was the NCO. It was like, we the backbone. So we, we do us, you know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, I'm I'm a problem solver, so I'm gonna figure it out. You know? Right, right. Yeah, so you did 17 years, um, and you also served now, in Iraq. now was it 17? Or am I wrong? I want to clarify. No, no, it was 17, uh-huh. but it was 17. I know people listening; they're probably uh, you know um, other other army service members. Was he active or was he part time? Because they oh, be yeah. part time, oh, okay. ain't week, no such thing. You know what I'm saying? The weekend warrior. Yeah, I was a week. <laughs> now I have no shame. I was a weekend yeah. warrior. Right, right, right. Now, but I was still a gangster of the army. I was still a killer. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I was still yeah. trained to kill right. at yeah. the end of the day. So um, what was the question about Iraq? Well, yeah, like I was going to say 17, you know, 17 years, and you clarified that, and you served in Iraq. Is that correct? 2009, 2010 mm-hmm. um, was my uh, time to go to Iraq. Um, and when I say it was my time, I volunteered. I could have not had, I could not have went. Right. Uh, and um, I chose to go f- for my own ego purposes. There were soldiers who were younger than me who came back from Iraq with war stories and and they were telling other soldiers, um, giving them, you know, you know, in case they go, they would say, hey, this is how it is. And, you know, um, and I felt as an NCO and as a, as a um, as part of the leadership I felt little, you know, slight handed. I was like, wow. I was like, well, how come I haven't went? I don't have any stories. I can't even talk to younger soldiers and, and tell them, hey, be careful when you go over there, blah, 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 whatever the case, give them some good guidance. Right. And so and so I raised my hand and says, you know what? 
I'll go. It was an opportunity to go. I would say, I want to see what this war is about. Let me see firsthand instead of hearing it uh, secondhand from other people. Right. You know, and, um, you know, and, and then when I went, you know, it was a life, life changing experience. What are things that you saw? What are things that you experienced that you can say like, wow, this was just eye opening to me? The, it, uh, it was an interesting landscape when you first get there. It's almost like textbook, like donkey, uh, you know, kid, dirty face and a, and a baby on the back. It was that, right. it was like that. Right. And I was like, whoa, this is like pictures I've seen in my history books, you know? Right. But, and it, it was, that was, I was taken back at that lifestyle. They didn't have no infrastructure where we were. It was uh, basically, it was barren. It was, there was no plumbing. There was no, so there was feces smell in the air. So everybody got, all the soldiers got sick. We all, for two weeks we had, you know, running bowel movements, you know, loose bowel movements. Mm -hmm. uh, But it was, uh, that was part of the infrastructure. But um, my job was basically to help rebuild the Iraqi infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't go over there to kill. Most people, when I tell I went to Iraq, they just think, well, was you on the front line? Was you killing? Did you have to, you know, shoot and then duck? Right. And, and I have to remind people, everybody, no matter if you're a nurse, police officer, whether you're an engineer, um, whether you're a medic, everybody has to learn how to protect themselves doing their job. I had to get used to the heat. In Kuwait, it was 150, and I thought they was joking. They was like, it's 150 degrees. I thought it was the heat from the plane because we had landed in Kuwait and got off the plane. And on the tarmac, I'm thinking to myself, okay, we've been in the air for so long. Mm-hmm. It's, the, it's the jet's um, heat that's putting off that's making us you know, uh, right. feel this extreme temperature. Right. So the further we walked away from the plane, it remained hot. And the thermometer said 150. We, I thought it was broke. And an NCO, <laughs> right. and, and I saw it. And an NCO had came over there and said, "What you looking at? At that thermometer is one fifty. It's not broke." And I was like, "Whoa!" Wow. And so, and so by the time I got to Iraq, it was like one twenty every day. So to adjust to that extreme heat woke me up. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought in the biblical days, I said that's why they wear turbans. The sun would dry them out. It would right. dehydrate them. Right. I was like, oh, that's why they wear, that's why they wear the clothing to keep from being dehydrated. So I was like, oh, I was making sense, you know. Mm. Until this day, too, like you still see a lot of people, you know, in that region, they wear like long sleeve shirts. Correct. Even when they're even when they're here, you know, they got they got to they got to they got to cover up. You think it, you know, you think you shouldn't, but you got to cover up in that, you know, keep your body uh from uh being burnt and stuff like that. So I guess that's what it is. But um, let me ask you this: as a mentor, would you suggest the military to a young person? I mean, I know you said I, it turned out good for you, and I, I have I, the reason why I asked that question because I have. Uh, a thought process that, you know, when people ask me about it, so I wanted to know what your thought process is. I share my experience and let them make the decision for themselves so that they don't say, man, you told me to go. Right. right. And so I, I learned to take the responsibility off me and tell them, I'll share with them, if you know how to play your cards, you can utilize the military to get things that you want. That's it. If you know, if you know what you want out of life, you can get a job in the military, make a, you know, get a test score that will meet the requirements of the type of job that you want. Right. And then, and then from there, if you listen to somebody who's been in, they can guide you and teach you how to take advantage um, of the opportunities that the military, uh, that the military can give you. Yeah. The reason why I said that is because, you know, you know, I've had friends over the years who had children and they said, well, you know, I'm going to send them to the military to straighten them out. I'm like, listen, man, you know, if your kid got problems, you know, the military ain't going to straighten out your problems. You know what I mean? But if, you know, if it, if it's minor and he got a head on him where he could at least listen and get some information, then yeah, you know, it might be all right. Exactly. And, and I tell a lot of people when I went in, in 2003, um, they were sending a lot of the, um, you know, uh, um, uh, the youth who were, you know, all the troublemaker youth. They'd be getting in front of the judge and the judge would say, you got two choices, young man. 
Join go to the, the military, join the army, go to jail. Or, or go to jail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when I went in, they was coming in based off, you know, man, I'm just here trying to avoid jail time, you know. Yeah. And and so, but now the day today's army is more structured. You have to be intelligent. You have to be intellectual now. You right. can't have you have all these protocols. You can't have certain tattoos on your body, and there's all these restrictions. Uh, and, and they want your, you know, they want the smartest nowadays. So. Uh, and, and like you said, you know, um, you know, a lot of people just send their kids and thinking that the military is going to fix them. No, right. you know, if your kid, if your kid is not disciplined, the military is not going to give you a child discipline who doesn't have discipline. Right. It's right. you know, because right. right. if they if they hate discipline, they're really going to hate a drill sergeant in your face. You know, the funny thing about it is, um, when I was in the service, what I noticed is that you know, the people that like to join the army to go to jail, guys. They actually turned out pretty good, but the borderline bad dudes that wasn't really bad, but they were just stupid or whatever the case may be. Like the gang bankers did pretty good, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right, 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 right. They start like they, getting that check, that, that yeah. check every two weeks. You like, yo, yeah. this army, this army check is good every two weeks. Yo, yeah. this is more okay. What do you okay, make on the street? Like yeah. More than you make on the street, and yeah. it's consistent. I got health, I got health benefits, dental benefits. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Start switching up the language after that. Right? <laughs> I mean, you start yeah. switching up. You like this is sweet. Every two weeks, like clockwork. First and fifteenth, that check dropping, and you be like, I know it's dropping, baby. Yeah. He was like, time to time to go to yeah. the mall, get some sneakers, baby. Yeah. Time to go to the strip club. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's it. I want to I want to talk about you know your consultant company because, like I said, you're a life coach. And, and and let me ask you a question because a lot of people use that term, life coach. Life coaches, right. they're life coaches. Um, for our audience, what does a life coach actually do? You know, like we, 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 some of us know, but right. just for for those that don't know. Well, I, I think um, everybody needs uh, um, the term life coach uh, is subjective. Mm-hmm. It's based on what you want it to be, right. and how I how I choose to look at it is that I provide a service that helps add to your life, brings peace and comfort and it helps I have tools to help you minimize your stress level mm-hmm. um, forever. Right. right. If you practice and if you listen. So life coaching to me is providing a service that adds to people's lives in a positive way. Okay. And I'm glad that you said that because a lot of people define it differently. Um, depending on who you're talking to, because anybody that's on social media is always a coach in something, but it's like, you never know where the credentials come from, what makes you qualified to tell me this, this, and this. So it was just something I just, you know, thought I'd throw out there to you. See what, no, you should ask that question yeah. because I have no PhD. Mm-hmm. I don't have a doctor, you know, in front of my name. Um, I didn't go to school. My school was life. Right. And, right. Me, and my, and my desire to want to take my negative, uh, experiences and turn them into positive. And when I reached out to the universe, I cursed God when I was in Iraq, when I was on that bridge, when we got hit by a bomb. And I was like, if you're real, I said, I need your presence. I like, I need to know that you're real. Cause right now, um, it don't look good, you know? And, and so I changed based off, um, you know, I was going to be another statistic coming home from, the, uh, coming home from Iraq. I, I was going to commit suicide. Mm. I was going through it. I was Rambo when I was over there bulletproof vest, I had a Beretta, I had an M4, I had the machine gun that Rambo had with the bullets feet out and I felt invincible. Right. And and it was like it was like going on the biggest roller coaster ride. And then said, okay, thank you for your service. Oh, why don't you go to school? Why don't you get a trade? Oh, why don't you? And it was like, I was still trying to process everything that just happened. Mm-hmm. I was like, wait a minute. I was programmed. I was, I was like, no. You know, it was hard to come home to readjust, you know. So like you said, you were in that particular situation where your life was on the line. Yeah. Spiritually, that put you in a different space. One space I was here until that boom, that hit. And then it's like, all right, now I got to change my perspective on things. You know what I mean? Is it, it forced me. It, it forced, forced me to change you. my Yeah, yeah. So it's like you got lined up correctly. <laughs> to exactly. Get your thoughts on track, you know what I mean? Exactly. What I what I learned was that sometimes through trauma, the trauma can either break you or make you. And I said, I, I'm a, uh, I'm not going to let it break me. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to turn this negative, this perceived negative uh, into a positive. Right. And um, it was me wanting answers to the solutions. Uh, I wanted answers to the to the problems 
that I was having and I didn't have the solutions. So I just asked God, my higher self, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to say, Jesus, um, Muhammad, whomever. I called out and, and that call was answered. And so, and I didn't deny it. And one thing that I want to point out to the listeners in what I did, I basically minimized my distractions. I stopped watching television, I minimized my my distractions so that I could hear from source or whatever type of voice that needed to come through a positive reinforcing voice. Uh, one that would guide me in the direction that I needed because I was in a dark space, that dark and light energy. So I was, I was, I was, I was coming from the light, but had a dark experience and I was stuck there trying to get back to, to the light. Now you say that, that, you know, just to backtrack, you had, um, you know, a life threatening experience. Can you walk the audience what exactly happened? Yeah. I know you mentioned the bomb, but what exactly happened? So, so um, 10 months, uh, my tour was 10 months. And the whole 10 months, I was doing infrastructure rebuilding. That means creating projects, which required my time in the community of, you know, like in Iraq, in the, in the neighborhoods, creating projects and um, uh, basically rebuilding the infrastructure. So after almost 10 months, the tour is almost over. And and every day we was missing bomb. We would miss, you know, um, a bombing or we would miss an attack. And it was right. like, yo, I was like, yo, if I could just make it, you know, you know, this 10 months, you know, wow, you know, I'm going to do some, um, some like miraculous things when I get out. So close to the end of the tour, uh, the last mission, and it was like ironic. Why did it have to be the last mission? Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, getting into my truck thirty seconds before somebody else got into my truck. It was the last seat, and then um, we did our um, briefings and, and meetings. And uh, it was about one hundred and twenty-five degrees. Everybody was hot. The AC wasn't working in the vehicles, and it was in April two thousand and ten, um, and. We were driving along, going to pick up uh, some some dignitaries, mm-hmm. and on our way there, I'm I'm just bouncing, going along with the uh, just going along with the ride and trying to keep cool. And all of a sudden, we hear a boom. The back truck gets hit by a bomb. Uh, we stop the truck, and and our ten months, nothing has happened to us, and we can't believe that this is actually happening on our last mission. Right? Mm-hmm. And so we stopped. We all get out. We, it, it threw us all off. It was three vehicles. So we get out running. Now, I'm going to paint a picture. To the east and to the west, there's nothing but desert. Mm. To, the, to the horizon, there's nothing but desert. Now, we got hit on a bridge. And there's this bumpy road. In Iraq, they, ha- they don't have, they don't follow, um, they, have no, they have no structure when it comes to um, driving. They right. just drive. And so to the east and west is desert. And 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 on this one stretch road, um, cars are are coming as we are stopping and trying to uh, you know attack this enemy that's that just hit us with a bomb. And now we got to check and see if soldiers are alive. In training, they told us there was two bombs. The first bomb is to stop the convoy. The second bomb is to kill as many people. And that's what they kept drilling us. We, we watched videos over and over. So I'm looking for the second bomb. And so I'm looking around. I'm exposed. I feel naked. I'm vulnerable. And I got my weapon ready to engage and ready to die. My soul is like, okay, this is it. This is it. I'm not going back home. I'm down here uh, in Iraq. Mm. And I remember looking in the back of the truck and there was lifeless bodies, which really messed me up. You know, and I was supposed to have been back there in that truck. Um, the interpreter, you know, uh, his, you know, um, head was decapitated, and, and the other soldier had a bomb. It went through his vest, and and it, and it and just to see that, and I couldn't react to it. And I had another guy begging for his life, and I'm waiting for the second bomb all at the same time. And so I remember um, I heard a bell, and I yelled, "Somebody's under the bridge." Well, they all ran up under the bridge. A few of them ran up under the bridge and they saw wires connecting and they just started cutting. Didn't know if cutting them would detonate the, the second bomb. They didn't know if that was the first bomb or they didn't know. They just right. started cutting. Well, that whole incident 
had a huge uh, effect on me because I did die in Iraq. My soul was there. Um, and, and it haunted me when I came home from Iraq to go back into society and go back to work and start dating. And, and, and I would be a minister to society. And I went back into society because I was so filled with anger, resentment. What could I have done to have um, maybe prevented this? So was it like and a survivor's like, remorse that you was going it through? It was some, a survivor's remorse of, uh, is what I was dealing with. Mm, yeah, you don't hear too many people talk about that. You know, I had a um, kidney transplant in 2020. And I think, you know, like those kind of, uh, what you say, like near-death experiences and stuff like that, I think it affects people in different ways. For me, you know, it was a situation where it's like, you know, I could have lost my life. So I'm saying, well... When I woke up the next morning, it's like, oh, when even when I got the first bad news, I had kidney issues where it was like, now I'm looking at the world different. Like, you know, I got to do more. You know, I got to enjoy my life more. I got to enjoy um, my family more. I got to pray more, you know. And it's, it's kind of funny that you should say that, you know, like you went to a dark place. Like, you know, I think everybody deals with things like that differently. You know what I mean? Um it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of weird to me because we I, like I said when we get into those kind of situations I think it makes people better people you know at the end of the day even though you had to go through a dark place to get there like I like I even see right now in you and talking to you from the, even from the beginning of the conversation like you have that zest for life I got to get it done I got to do something you know to keep it going and I think you know I think that's something that come, pulls out of most people that come through those situations do you feel the same way or? I do you know and again a trauma sometimes either makes you or break you. And um, it, I look at it now is that I, in order to get where I am now, I needed to go through that. Right. Some people say, do you, right. do you have any regrets? I said, no, no regrets. Right. Because they, they were lessons. All the experiences are lessons. And if I didn't get the lesson out of that, then I would be still searching out going through a similar experience uh, to wake me up, mm-hmm. to push me tw- towards the light. And the light is all there is. That means all things goodness. I, I'm aware that of the darkness that I have, and I talk about this thing called the beast that lies within. The beast is like the dark energy. The beast is like brush my shoulder. I'm gonna let the beast out, and, let, and when the adrenaline starts flowing, we Superman for about five to ten minutes, you know. And it was like uh, learning how to control that dark side of me, learning how to control the beast. I was a hothead when I came home from Iraq. I wanted blood. I wanted to fight. I moved to LA. I was in traffic. I was just spazzing out. I was like, dude, chill out. And trying to balance the dark and the light that is within me. I am all things. I look at myself. If I'm part of the creator um, uh, and the creator is everything, then I'm all things as well. And so, therefore, I am darkness and I am light. I need to control my darkness uh, and uh, operate from the light. And, you know, if somebody break into my house, I turn the darkness on. I match your energy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. this is yeah. a part of you that's not completely gone yet. yeah I'm, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. It, it'll never it, it, it'll never leave i just have to be a manager a supervisor i have to be an owner of that beast that sits in a cage that doesn't have a lock that at any given moment when it comes out the adrenaline flow is like incredible hook mm-hmm. uh as somebody said incredible hook is basically the story of humans when uh they're angry the adrenaline starts flowing and they can do superhuman things, punch holes in the wall, you know, or just lift things that they normally couldn't lift when the adrenaline is not activated. Mm. Uh, and so, um, and so when the credible Hulk is tearing up things and he's, he's, he's mad. And then when he comes off the adrenaline as David Banner, he feels so bad. And that's every human, mm. every human, uh, when they react and that dark side, that beast that's ready to come out and say, say something smart, say something smart. And it was like, um, you know, I had to learn how to control the dark side because mm. I felt like I had reached that dark side in Iraq and and just dealing with it and just being present, you know. Yeah. And even in that, I guess when you came back from Iraq and you have, you know, like you say, that that darkness in you, that it affects the people around you. You know what I mean? And it yes. draw people near you, pushes them away. You know what I mean? Because they don't understand what's going on with you. And and to be quite honest with you, some of us just don't want to take that negativity on from anybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? You want to Correct. incorporate yeah. it in what you have. So what was the things that you did to kind of bring yourself uh, out of that? You know what I mean? What was the, the, uh, the go moment on that one? Well, what I did, I, I listened to my inner self. I had to practice listening to myself. Mm-hmm. 
as long as my intuition and my thoughts wasn't telling me to go kill nobody, it's like, um, go to Hollywood. Don't you, now that you've left Iraq, go to Hollywood. Right. That's what you should do. You should go and, and, um, and be an actor. Try that out. You know, you almost died. You almost didn't make it. So why not? So it was that push really, but I was so torn because I'm from Alabama. My mother just had, I was the second of her sons that went to Iraq. So it was like I had one son that survived. Now another son mm-hmm. uh, came home. He survived, and now you're going to like California. My mother had never really been out of the state, so it was like, like California. What are you doing? Like she was yelling at me, and out of anger, and out of frustration, and out of confusion, mm-hmm. and out of her her youngest son is now you know almost lost him in Iraq, and now he's going to California. Right. But so. I was like Pinocchio. I said, I don't have strings on me. I have no children, not married. Mm. Um, I was like, what's stopping me from going to LA and pursuing my passion? Right. And I was like, nothing. And it took a lot of effort. And um, I finally made that move and never looked back. And making that move, what drove me out there, the carrot that drove me out there was acting and entertainment and going to film school. What I discovered was I was out there to do some self-development, to work on myself, to push me towards the light. I was mm. like, oh, now when I'm sitting in my apartment, November 2013, I got laid off uh, from the entertainment job I was working at. And uh, November 2013, I'm landing the floor of my apartment, no television, just listening to my inner thoughts, just really wanting higher knowledge and just really wanted solutions to my problems. Mm. And I said, um, man, I got six to nine months to just ride this unemployment out. I was like, wow, I, mean, I could I could live off this. Right. You know, I was like, ooh, right. this is sweet. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm about to hibernate, you know. Right. And, um, and as I was laying in my apartment thinking about hibernating and just doing nothing for six to nine months, a voice came through. Now, there was no TV on. There's no distraction. I minimized all distractions so that I could think clearly. And a voice came through and it said, if you don't take this time out to do some self-development, shame on you. And it was loving, it was compassion, it was caring, but it was almost like a stern teacher. And I and I opened my eyes. I was like, I heard that. It was like, and I didn't didn't question it. It wasn't no negative stuff. It just said, if you don't take this time out that you have to yourself to do some self-development, shame on you. And I was like, it almost like chastised me. Mm. Like, why would you sleep when you could be doing the work? I put my foot on the gas at that moment and never took my uh, foot off. And what I developed was a method to live life very simply. And that method is basically what people already know. I had to learn um, how to love myself unconditionally over again Mm. and realize that I was operating on conditional love. The polar opposite of unconditional is conditional. We put conditions on our love. Sometimes I learned that from my environment, whether family, social environment, uh, at school, church, just being out in the public. I learned, I watch how people conditionally love themselves, mm-hmm. right? television and movies. And so I relearn how to unconditionally love myself over and over through repetition, 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 like a computer, reprogramming my mind, redownloading new software to mm-hmm. operate on. The second one was no judgment of any kind. I said, dude, stop judging yourself about Iraq. Stop judging yourself about your past, you know, like childhood, unresolved issues. Stop judging yourself, you know, have no judgment of any kind. Third one was forgiveness. I had to practice forgiveness, repetition over and over. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself for the past. Forgive your parents. They know not what they was doing. They did the best they could. You have expectations that they don't even know. They can't even meet them. Right. The expectation, unspoken expectation that I had of my parents, they didn't know it. But I had this, you know, this judgment, this anger towards them. And they had no clue of my expectation. I was doing it to myself. Mm. So the moment, so the moment I start practicing unconditional love to myself at every moment, no judgment of any kind to myself at every moment, and forgiveness, and minimizing negative expectations. That would cause me to have disappointments in life. Say that again, said, brother. Dude, Say that again, yeah, brother. That's it, that's it right there. Yeah. Say it again, brother. Mi- mi- minimizing negative expectations so that I don't experience disapp- uh, extreme disappointments in life. Mm-hmm. And so what I had to do was 
minimize expectations of myself that I should be, you know, I would, I would, I would ridicule myself. I would say, man, you be creating all these projects, but you don't never finish them. You, man, you create a hundred projects. Mm-hmm. And I would talk down to myself, man, you ain't nothing. Yeah, man. Look. And I stopped doing that. I stopped doing that because I was speaking life. I was casting a spell on myself mm. and didn't know it. And I said, if you love you, if you love yourself unconditionally, why would you treat yourself that way? Yeah. My only thing I would add to that is get rid of negative people. <laughs> uh, well, as much well, as you can, because you got you got some people that, you know, like we got family members that we just you tell it, you know, you, you, yeah. you stuck to them man. you, you got to ride with them. You know what I mean? And and as much as well, let me change that because you know the older I get now, it's like wait a minute, I'm gonna ride with you, but I'm gonna put you here for a second. Exactly, there's, there nothing, second, there's nothing wrong with taking a break from family members who can be toxic, who are not willing to do the work on themselves, who are who are not willing to take responsibility for their actions. I right, grew up right. blaming. I grew up blaming the devil in the south. Blame the devil. Tell the truth. Shame the devil. Blame yeah. the devil. Devil made me do it. Devil made me do it. Devil, devil keep making me do things. That takes the responsibility away from you. Mm-hmm. So it's like I had to reprogram myself. I says, no, you can't blame no devil. You can't blame nobody else. Um, take responsibility. What are you doing to fix whatever is um, bothering you? Right. Right. It's just certain things that you, that's just, it was in you to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, we're a real breed, man. You know, because there's a lot of people walking around this earth, man, and um, it's just like, man, you just don't want to fix the situation that you're in. Like, you're just gonna you're gonna stay there, you know. And I and I don't understand that, you know. What I mean, and I don't think I ever been like that. But even the older I get, I'm even more like, you know, like, listen, nah, there's a way to fix this, you know. What I mean, you know, um, intuitively, I can read people, and I I can say, okay, you don't want the knowledge, you don't want to change. That's fine. I have family members that don't want to change. Um, and I try to help him put the crown on top of the head. Like I'm just, I feel good about myself. I have, I have answers to salute, I have solutions to, to uh, problems that arise in my life. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not stressed because I understand what stress does. Stress turns into a physical sickness. And that's not my objective to make myself sick, to get physically sick, the headache, the migraine, the thought, a thought of anger about something, holding an expectation and being extremely disappointed. Now I got a headache. The headache turns to a, a physical sickness. And now, you know, you're calling off work. Now your immune system is weak. Now it leaves room for any type of attack for viruses or anything to come into your life. And now you're just like, woe is me. And so I know the causes and the effects of thinking negative. Mm. I just don't do it. So I say, hey, you know, I discovered something, you know, y'all got free will. I'm never going to force myself on you. You know, if you listen, you listen, you don't. I'm going to keep pushing this message, you know. As a life coach, when you see, you know, people come in, come into you for help, right? Um, you ever look at somebody and be like, nah, I can't help them, man. It's nothing I can do for them, man. There are some people, I basically tell them the truth. I said, um, basically, the intuition and the discernment tells me that they don't want to change. And I'll, and I'll verbalize. I'll say, hey, you don't want to change, but when you're ready to change, um, you know, they say when a, a student is ready, a teacher will come. Mm-hmm. So when you're ready, uh, a teacher will come, whether it's me or somebody else. So I don't I don't worry about people who are not ready, who say they want the help, because I could smell uh, and I could tell if they really desire the help, you know. Yeah. And it's a, it's a real, like I said, it's a real group. Cause um, I'll give you an example. Like um, I work with um, some young people, right. And, you know, as an older person now, I can say, you know, listen, this is what I did, you know, financially to get myself on track stocks, you know, show them how to work the 401k or whatever like that. And you could be speaking to a group of all of them. And this one person that the light goes off on. And, you know, she's like, yo, listen, show me how to start this account. Yeah help me or whatever like that. And you, you can see the light on. So I wonder, like, you know, like, like I said, that's why I asked that question in regards to a life coach, because when people come in, you can automatically look at a person and be like, Oh, this person wants to get out of that situation. They want to be better. You know what I mean? So, you know, have you ever seen anybody that you thought were negative overcome, you know, some of the, some of their fears and, you know, some of the things that they were continuously doing wrong. An example of my, of my nephew. Hmm. Uh, my nephew is 22 years. One of my nephews, I have like 13, uh, 15 uh, nieces and nephews. And one of my nephews is 22. 
And um, I didn't think that he had the ability to listen. I, th- I thought he was too young to absorb because he was always on his video game and he would be had listening. And, um, and, and he was one of my first clients that I worked on since he was 14. I wanted, I wanted this young black king to have knowledge. And I started with him very young. And I was from Los Angeles calling him to Alabama, making sure that I was feeding him knowledge, but making sure that I was not infringing on, on, on his free will to choose. And so he was one that I thought that, that I wasn't, um, that I couldn't, that I, I, I didn't think he would get it. I thought it was too advanced for him. Uh, but it was through the power of repetition. It's repeating things over and over. We say, oh, I said that. No, it's repeating it because when we first learned how to drive, we had to drive a hundred times before it became unconscious where we just get in the car, we just drive to point A to point B and right. forget how we got there. Right. So I use a method of, of, of repetition, but, but he was, he was an example that, um, that was just in the streets, you know, a little young, you know, Wanted to be part of the gang life, and he was just, you know, r- just, you know, just running rampant and just didn't care. And right. then, but um, but I was able to um, instill. I knew that the knowledge that I was sharing with him, uh, his spirit knows truth, no matter how young he was. So right, I was speaking right, right. to his spirit, not his physical mind. Right. And I knew that through repetition, had I just keep talking to him that he would go out to the world and subconsciously it would be sitting in the back of his brain. And then it, and, and it happened one day, he called me one day. He says, Oh, you know, the knowledge you was giving me. He's like, it actually worked. I was <laughs> like, Oh, he's like, man, I want to thank you, man. Right. Right. I mean, you know, and, um, and I, here's a, a quick story from that. Um, he called me one day when I was in Los Angeles and he says, Oh, he says, man, my girlfriend just broke up with me. And uh, she left her coat over here and she coming over here with her new guy. He said, man, she come over here. I swear, both of them going to get chopped down. He's like, I swear. I was like, oh, I said, okay. I says, well, you know, take responsibility um, for your actions. He says, man, you ain't going to get mad if I go to prison? Like if I go to jail? I said, no. That sounds like a conscious choice for you to uh, hurt somebody. And I said, if you do do that, just make sure that you're... um, you're open to the uh, effects from your cause. Right. Uh, you know, I said, you do not own her. She's not your property. I said, there'll be, mi- I said, you're young. There'll be many women that you come in contact with that you're going to be learning from. You're not, they're not, they don't belong to you. I said, because we come from a society to where a man looks at a woman. Yeah. You my woman. I own you. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I spend time with you and you leave me, you leave, you taking my love, the love that I gave to you, mm. all the time and energy and money that I spent, and now we're ready for violence. Yeah. So I was teaching him how to love in a different way that was unconditional. I says, give her an opportunity to see what kind of guy she wants. You just to stop along the way. You guys are young. She may have 17 different guys. She may have five. I said, but give her an opportunity to be with a guy that she thinks is good for her and let her learn on the past. That's unconditional love. And he accepted it. And he called me two weeks later. I said, man, you got the wrong friends. I said, your friend's going to lead you to prison. Yeah. And he called me two weeks later. He said, oh, I got rid of those friends. Yeah. I was like, you, you did? I was I was shocked to hear him say, hey, I got rid of those friends. I thank you for that advice, man. It saved me. Yeah. Oh, he got a ble- he got a blessing all the way around. He got rid of the friends and the and the girl, man. So yeah. you know, oh, I'd, I'd have told him, man, that's the best thing that ever happened to you, brother. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the best thing. The best thing, yeah. you know, yeah. bro- brother, uncle, mentor, life yeah. life coach. Hey, listen, yeah. I mean, I, I actually had another question in my head, but since you said this, we're gonna pivot over to this one. How do we actually apply that to our kids out here? You know, like I know you do your your mentoring thing and and all. You have your your you know, people come to you, but it's like, do you take that and you say, let me get these group of, of black kids right here or these group of kids don't necessarily have to be black because a lot of them, a lot of people go through different things, but our people catch it the most. I'm going to be honest. So what it is, is like, how do we get a lot of the youth out of that dark mind state that they're in? And when I say it's dark, it's because darkness is pushed upon them constantly, whether it be through, you know, music, movies, things that they see. Their so-called heroes these days have dark mentalities, and it's like this is the stuff that they're ingesting, 
And this is the things that's probably more influential to them than, you know, unfortunately their parents would be or their uncles would be or anything like that. So what what, what would you do in that situation if you're not doing it? Do you have something tailored towards like gathering these guys up and just telling them the truth? Well, everybody needs entertainment. Most people need entertainment. So I provide uh, a, a, I bring the light. It's the law of balance, mm. the law of polarity. So if they're in darkness, I just add more light and understanding and education. Because again, their spirit knows the truth when they hear it. Right. If I'm speaking right. truth, all I have to do is consistently, it needs to be consistent having these group meetings to where they see the consistency, the cycle. I have to create a cycle to where they see that at Tuesday at seven o'clock, uh, are we going to be talking about um, um, how to live a stress-free life, mm-hmm. you know, how to minimize stress in your life. And I think it's through consistency and through repetition and through entertainment. You take the what their entertainment, you find out what they're, um, I, I like the, uh, the um, Jesus parable. You know, Jesus used parables, right? Mm-hmm. He took parable stories and incorporated the message into the story. Mm-hmm. And so that's the tech that I use I like to entertain. And while I entertain through my filmmaking, everybody want to be in front of the camera. Right. Everybody, everybody want to be, you know, part of the entertainment movies and everybody's creative. They just don't know how to express it. Mm. So I, I help those young men by asking them, what, are, what do they want to do by not having no judgment and unconditional love and listening to them about what their problem was ailing them, right? Because they can't really learn new information if they can't, if I don't give them the tools to solve the problems at home and say, hey, the problem that you're dealing with at home is on the temporary. Here's what I'm going to share with you. Because sometimes we as children, um, we become uh, sometimes guidance for our parents, you know? Sometimes we become the, sometimes we become the healers to heal our parents. Yeah, definitely. And so, so I teach kids basically uh, how to basically take a situation without infringing, again, upon their free will to choose. I just share knowledge that's truth. It sounds like truth, right? And it is truth. That's truth to their spirit because spirit knows truth. And I exemplify a light so great because greatness will get mimicked. Michael right. Jordan, everybody's, you know, shooting fadeaways, tongue out, you know, right, right. Like, you know, anybody, Michael Jackson, everybody's doing, if anything I do is great, we have to do is great and, and with intention, uh, the kids will see that and they will want to mimic that greatness that's in front of them. Right. Because I, I, I look at it and I see like a lot of the violence and things that you see that's going on um, amongst the youth is because of lack of problem solving skills, lack of coping skills you know, things of that nature. And it's like, you would, you, you're you not going to get it in school. You're not going to learn these tactics in school because a lot of your educators are not from where you are and can't meet you where you are. So that's what kind of sparked me to say that. It's like, you have this, you know, you're, you're consulting firm and it's like, you know, I'm quite sure you, you do things within the community to, 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 yes. try to help these guys. Because I was, I was listening to a radio show one time where one of the, you know, older, you know, elders was saying, the problem with us as we get older is that kids have become, have gotten to the point where the the elders are afraid to talk to them, you know, or, or, or are kind of reluctant to talk to them based upon the reactions that they will get from them. I mean, we live in a society where people are beating up elders just for saying, hey, you know, pull your pants up, you know what I mean? So it's like we're kind of getting to that point where it's like you're afraid to kind of show them something because of that. I mean, and, and from now, you're withholding knowledge from them. You want to get what I'm saying? Also, too, I think the other issue is that we become, um, I think these kids are becoming desensitized, man. You know what I mean? Because their entertainment diet is trash, man. You know, like you was just talking about entertainment before. And uh, I was going to ask you about, you know, is there anything that you have planned in the works in the future, you know, working with, or do you see going on in Hollywood now to make a change? Because when it comes to African-Americans, man, our entertainment diet is trash from the music, uh, from the movies, you know what I mean? And it's sad to say, because you know, I know there's a um, it's a tough time because for you guys, because our people like trash. You know, I hate to say it. You know, a lot of our people like so trash. Some of us, yeah, some, some. You know what I mean? So it's kind of hard to make money and get that balance. And you know what I mean? Like and be and be cool. Everybody want to be cool. Right, right. So, right. I, so I, I call myself a spiritual gangster, spiritual gang star. Right. So it sounds cool. So it makes me look cool. Like it's cool to be in the light. 
it's cool to have the knowledge. Hey, I tell people, hey, you can go to the dark. You know, and, and, and going back to the adults, the adults are afraid to talk to the kids because uh, they themselves are not here. Mm. I have no fear of talking to a child that, that claim he a thug. Because you can't be you can't be on part time, two part time and live a long life. So if you right. live this long, you ain't that bad. You ain't that hard. You ain't right. you're not that terrorizing the neighborhood for right. real. But that park energy, <laughs> you gonna get dealt with really quick. Right, right. Yeah. And then you and then you know the nuts out the gate. Like you just said, your nephew, when he called you and made that call, that's really a call for help. It ain't really like I'm gonna do it. Cause people that are about that are gonna just, just do gonna it. Do it. You he wants you to tell exactly. him don't do yeah. it. Right. He wanted me to talk him off the ledge and I read through it. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I and I didn't, I was like, hey, if that's what you want to do, that's a decision you want to make. Right. Like you ain't gonna get mad at me. I'm like, no, I, I, that's your decision. If you want to go to prison, hey, go ahead. Yeah. I'm not gonna stop you if that's the decision. You got free will. I'm not gonna talk you off the ledge because you want me to talk you off the ledge. Right. Go ahead and jump. Go ahead and jump. You know. Go and, you knew, and, you, and, you, and you knew he didn't want to jump. You know what I mean? I knew he didn't. I, I I knew he didn't want to jump, but it had to be okay if he did jump. Right. That's a spiritual, and some people may be like, wow, that's cold-blooded. That's a narcissist. Think it only about yourself. No. Well, I say I'm a walking contradiction. I'm everything. I'm all things. I'm all things. I'm who I, who I need to be at any given moment. But I knew at that moment in my intuition, my discernment, that he did not want to uh, jump off the ledge. He wouldn't be on the phone talking to me about what he was going to do. He would have just done it. Yeah. And we coming from, you know, we come from the hood, so... um we know right off the back, you know, if you really mean it or not, you know what I mean? So, you know, oh, go, yeah. ahead, yeah. go, go ahead and yeah. go ahead and jump, give it a shot, see what happens, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But, but he was looking for sympathy. He went, Oh, nephew, man, don't do that, man. Yeah. Oh man. You don't go to prison. I love you, man. That's what he wanted. He That's wanted, wanted to be, uh, he wanted the sympathy. I was like, I gave him tough love. I was like, All right, if that's what you want to do, you know? But it saved his life. Saved I tell, he me and thanked me. Yeah. I tell kids all the time, man, and sometimes parents, you know, like some people, you you might need to go to jail. You might need to go to jail. <laughs> Just to show up. I enough. agree. Yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it work out for people. You know what I mean? When you I came agree. out, you'd be like, "Yeah, I don't want to go back there no more." You know what I right, mean? You right. might need to go. You can go one of two ways. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, that's how it works. Take your route. <laughs> take your route. Yeah, take your route. Yeah. <laughs> In this life, in this life journey called life, you know, you got you get infinite routes, uh, infinite yeah. route. There's no limit to what type of route you can take mm-hmm. to uh, get to the light. Yeah. Everybody got to get to the light. The light, it, it's already said the light wins anyway. So why even entertain the darkness? I know the dark. I know I have darkness. I know I could tear up a room. I know my stature. You know, when I walk into a room, right. uh, it, you know, I know what I, I'm capable of. But I don't have that intention. I control the beast that is within me. I'm the owner of that beast that lies, the dark side of me. And I tell that beast, hey, I'm your owner. You stay in the cage. Um, uh, here's a quick here's a quick story with my nephew. Again. I love talking about my nephew because he's very dear, uh, near and dear to my heart. And he's probably one of the students that I have that's really honed in, like a changed young man, right? Going from street to just like really being just who he is today as a respectable young man that's looking for light, but also he has a balance of dark and light within him. Right. Um, so there was a, there was a moment in time to when I moved from Los Angeles back to Alabama during COVID, my nephew, I could tell had not had the best experiences at home with family members and friends. I could tell that I could just discern that mm-hmm. me coming in all nice and loving and yes, nephew, you know, what do you want? And give it and feeding him knowledge in a very calm way. I wasn't yelling at him. And I, he would ask me several questions. Sometimes he, he'd be redundant. And I would just continue at answering the questions from a place of love, knowing that the repetition, he needs to hear it. So in order for him to, for it to click. Well, I was showing him something. I handed him a piece of paper. And when he took that piece of paper, he snatched it out of my hand. Mm. And the beast said, let me out. Grab him through the window. Break it. Draw blood. Mm. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's showtime. And, I, and then for a split second, and I said, if I, sh- if I do that, if I exemplify a violent act, it's showing him, he, he's looking up to me. He's going to say, well, in order to solve problems, you got to use violence. My uncle did it to me and I look up to him. Mm. So for a split second, I said to myself, nope, we're not going to use violence. 
we're going to use intellect. Take the knowledge away from him. You've already been feeding him. He's around you because he knows it works. So right, just right. take away, take your presence away. And I was able to call down that beast that wanted to just say, hey, yeah, yeah. he want to go at it. And so what I did was, on well, a nanosecond, it says, nope, you teach him an intellect, solve problems intellectually. So I says, nephew, I says, you jerked that out of my hand. I said, that was a form of disrespect from my, from my book. I says, now, uh, I said, I could be on high and by terms with you in this city. I says, and I won't feel no type of way. Trust me, you the one need the knowledge. And I drove off. Five minutes later, he's calling back. Hey, um, uh, I, I think I did it on purpose. And I apologize, man. I, apologize. I said, I want you to go in the city and see who's giving you the knowledge that I'm sharing with you. I'm putting a crown on top of your head. I got this knowledge at 30, in my 30s. And I said, I'm giving it to you. You've been, I've been training you since 14. You're going to be a powerhouse, right? I didn't tell you that, but this is how I'm looking at yeah. it. As, as a disciple that I'm planting a seed into the world. And he goes out into the world and he's shining quietly, you know? And so he's affecting other people. But when, but when he called and apologized, I accepted his apology quick. But it was in that split second. So the moral of the story is that I was able to control the beast, that dark side within me, and use intellect. Because as black men, every time we you know, solve problems, most of the time it's with violence. And that beast comes out, that mm-hmm. beast don't have an owner. Yeah, that, sure. adre- that adrenaline's flowing, the beast want to come out, and the beast want to wreak havoc for about five, ten minutes. And after that adrenaline flow um, calms down, we like, I did what? I tore that off? Like, wow, what is wrong with me, that's, right? That's and it's if like, you get the chance to even say that. You know if, you, if, if, if you, you get, get the chance, the chance if, yeah. if you get the chance if you live if you live through it able, if you live through it right uh you say wow you always have regrets i didn't want to yell like that i don't want to be that beast that's an ugly beast that comes out right right and so i was able to exemplify peace and order within me and bring balance and says huh no don't do that because then he's going to continue to solving problems with violence. Well, you know, and also too, it's like, it's funny that you said that, is that he saw your power when you didn't react that way because, you know, growing up, you know, violence is just a natural thing that we understand. But, you know, even in the hood, you know, we knew that, you know, you know, we saw power when somebody said, yeah, listen, I'm going to let you slide. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to give you a pass right now. You know what I mean? And I could really hurt you. It's just like kind of like even watching movie The Godfather, that portion where... He's in the room and all of the people is, you know, talking about killing his son. And he says, um, you know, I'm just doing this because my son right now. But, you know, if something happened to my son, I'm going to blame some of the people in this room. <laughs> and that's not right. that's not what I'm going to forgive right now. You know, so when he says that, it's like the coldest thing in the movie because he's like, I could react and wild out right now. But right now I'm looking for peace. And, you know, it's hard. You know, like you said, the 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 um the most the, the, I think the most power that you can show is that when you hold back yourself, you know what I mean? To say, you know, and, and like you said, you, you didn't show any weakness to him because you're telling him also too. like, listen, you know, in the way I, you know, I'm, I can't remember exactly how you said it, but in, in your way of talking, you said like, listen, I could, I could flex on you right now, but I, I'm, I'm going to just leave you alone right now. And also I'm just letting you know, I love you because I'm, I give you this information, you know, but I don't have to do that. You know what I mean? And I stepped off, you know, so in his mind, he thinking like, dang, you know, I could have, could have went left with me just now, you know what I mean? And he, you know, he showed, chose, he chose strength, you know what I mean? And that's something that even in my life, it stuck with me over years that I saw older gentlemen in my family done that because I recognize, you know, I could be objective, you know what I mean? I could fall back and not show weakness and, you know, stuff, like, you know what I mean? So I think you did a good thing with that, you know what I mean? It's exemplifying the light. If I'm going to talk about the light, I need to practice what I preach. And he's going to do that to somebody. Exactly. Yeah, and then yes, guess what? Now. Yeah. And somebody's going to do it, to, you know, and it's going to get passed Travel. on. Travel so on, I, I knew I was planting a seed. Right. I was right. planting a seed that would be inside of him that he would remember that action that I gave him, that I solved it, learned teaching him how to use. He saw it in action because most black people, we like to see it. Don't tell me. Don't tell me about it. Show me. Show me. Right, right, right. They say actions speak louder than words. I showed him right. through my actions of what it looked like and what it felt like to have nobody yell at you and to give you the same energy, snatching something out of it. 
if you snatch anything out of somebody's hand, especially black or black male, yeah. oh, blood, bloodshed is about to come. You're going That's the causes to zero. and the effect. <laughs> going straight to zero. That's right. Right? Yeah. And so, th- th- so I teach young black men how to be more intellectual. It's expected that we go zero to 100 with violence. That's a given. Grandmama can pull the trigger. Yeah. But the most powerful thing is to use your words, use your mind, use light, use love, and see the pain within him and see the game that he was playing. Because I looked at that moment, he was my teacher and my student all in the same breath. Right. And I was like, oh, he's my teacher. Showing me, am I, am I practicing the knowledge that I'm sharing with him? Am right. I practicing peace? Right, right. All right, so listen, man, in our final moments together, I want I want to just um, ask you, what do you have on the horizon in terms, because you still, you know, cinematographer, award-winning producer, and it's just like my brother was saying, like, with all of the, the negativity of things that you see our people uh, is being forced upon within Hollywood, you know what I mean? What, what, what projects are you working on? And is there a way that you're using, you know, that voice of yours in that area to kind of combat you know, showing us in a negative light. Yes. Um, I, I look to do some sitcoms mm-hmm. and in, in those sitcoms, I am placed in the food, uh, the nourishment of unconditional love into each message mm-hmm. and no judgment and forgiveness. So eat, so implanting the message into my art is now my life's calling mm-hmm. and everything that I do. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm doing more speaking engagements mm-hmm. so that I that I interact with a larger audience. So, so that especially our young black men that we wake up and to and that we like. I'm gonna show people. I wanna share my my kingship um, right. with young black men. So if you're around somebody's energy that is energized, you too get energized. So I've been. Uh, so I'm working on uh, building my YouTube channel um, I, and as a filmmaker. I, like I, like going to film school, I get um, I get into my perfectionist state. You know, it's got to be this way. How why would they do this video without any sound? I was like, no, don't do that. And so uh, I'm now going to start because I know that people need it. And I and I've had a couple of suicides around me within the past three or four months, and it hit home to me. And I was like, now is the time to really get out there and really uh, uh, make the audience a lot bigger. Within the uh, except for the um, with the exception of the small audience that I've been dealing with, uh, but I'm, I'm putting myself out there more. I have a publicist, and Chris is helping me with those plans of really, um, you know, groundbreaking um, events that I'm going to be doing in the future. Uh, conferences, basically teaching people how to love themselves in a fun way. Uh, that really puts the power back into their hands. And my objective is to really get our black males really to uh, be empowered and take this knowledge uh, and use it for themselves and see for, and, and just use it, you know, unconditional love to yourself, practice over and over, no judgment of any kind over and over forgiveness over and over and over until it becomes repetitious. Uh, do it a hundred, do it a hundred times. It becomes innate. Right, right. Do it back to back. Do it back to back. Do it right. back to back. Do it back to back. And do it back to back. You speed up the process of you learning and just continue doing it forever until it becomes until you become on autopilot. So, so a lot of projects that I'm working on. Um, I've got um, puppets. I got a puppet show that I'm going to be doing for kids, mm-hmm. incorporating the message of unconditional love, no judgment, and forgiveness into the puppet that I have. Um, it's a. It's, it looks like a Sesame Street character. I spent a lot of money from London, mm-hmm. and I was like, uh, I'm gonna put seeds into the children. I'm gonna plant seeds into the children, so when they get older and become adults, they will remember this unconditional love. Yeah, that's. I was gonna say, man, because it's funny you said just the puppet thing. I mean, that's definitely a good way of going. But as a kid, even in our world, coming up in Brooklyn, you know, we had so much entertainment that was. Um, that was positive and it kept these certain messages in your head. Don't, you know, like watching good times and fat Albert and, you know, stuff like that. These are things, you know, psycho, you know, I, I, I think they stuck in my head, you know, you can't hurt old people. You can't, you know, certain things that, that was just, you know, just stuck in our head constantly or pushed in our head constantly. You know, I mean, you got something good out of it. George Jefferson, uh, what's happening, you know, 
all of this stuff Knowing like that. Knowing it's half the battle. Break dancing. Yeah. And, and I don't and I don't and I don't see that in our entertainment no more. You know what I mean? And uh I think that's the the thing thing that we're missing, you know what I mean? And I you know, people talk bad about these children now, you know, but uh the problem is is that we're not giving them anything. Exactly. And 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 not only that, are we influenced by the society, but we're also influenced by movie making, watching movies. Right, right. We right. watch. We watch how to. I I didn't know anything about turning the gun forty five degree um at a forty five degree angle. Right. I, I think that was from Boys in the Hood, right? Boys in the Hood, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. about every movie in the nineties, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. You can pick it up, yeah. Right. So, so that movie making seeps into the brains unconsciously into our environments. It's funny you mention and, that, bro, because I was telling my daughter this, and I mean, I don't, you know, we all from that era, man. And so, you know, these kids are rediscovering, you know, these movies that we used to watch. And, you know, she was telling me, I think she was watching, like, Don't Be a Menace or whatever, some, something of that nature. And I said, did you ever notice in all of those movies in the 90s that anytime some black man was making it out the hood or going to college, they ended up dying violently? Uh, and it was like, what was the message? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, psych- psychologically, Bingo. it would make black people go, you know, hey, I ain't going to make it. I may become successful, but I'm, you know, I ain't gonna be out of here. So it's right. basically taking the black male out of the home quickly. Sometimes mm. you could be doing it sub- subliminal psych- psychology. When I was in film school, I coined this phrase. Mm. I said, "Man, I said I'm a movieologist. <laughs> I got the ability to make somebody cry in an instant, make somebody laugh at this cue, and if it's good enough, they're gonna laugh. I can make somebody think." I was like, "Oh." I can manipulate people's emotions and I could make them think. I said, I'm a moviologist. I said, and then when I became conscious, I says, you can no longer make violent movies. You can, but the causes and the effects are huge. Are you contributing to the downfall of your community and to the people that's watching your content? Or are you going to be a conscious creator and create with love and light and incorporate beautiful messages? Now make it, make the content cool and entertaining, but yet, you can make loving yourself be cool. Bring balance to the uncool and to the cool. Yeah, and like you, that you know, law polarity. Yeah, yeah, and you can, you can. I, I think a lot of our filmmakers now probably need to look within themselves and say, you know, um, I could change this world, man. I could change, especially for our people. I could change this world. And um, I, I use Bill Cosby as an example. I mean, nobody wants to talk about Bill Cosby or nothing like that now, but. The reality of it all is the first time I saw a different world, I was like, man, that's how black college is like. You know what I mean? Everybody wanted to go to black college then. You know what I mean? I think even I think there was a statistic that says like right after a different world had showed like, you know, the um, what is it, the enrollment for enrollment you know went up. enrollment went up crazy for, you know, people at, going to um at HBCUs. HBCU. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. So I mean, you know, I think a lot of the people that, you know, just don't you know, do what the status quo tells you to do, man. You know, step it to the next level and try to do something that, you know, empower people, man, empower our people. You know, and I, and I hate that. You know, I'm, I don't, I ain't got no racist bone in my body, man. I like black, Hispanic, white, whatever the case may be. But, you know, for our people, man, we just so. Yes. I don't know, man. We're, I, I, we're, we're, we're behind, but that's okay. We don't get caught up. Right. Because my mission is to really catch us up mentally because we have that mental blockage right, that right, right. We're, we're, we're stuck in the past and we're stuck in trying to catch up with white people with money and it's like we don't want right. to see I, I want to see what having a nice house feels like I want to see what having a million dollars feels like I want to see what owning a business and being able to travel when you want to travel feels like right so until we get that out of our system uh not saying that we'll ever get it out of our system but what I'm saying is bringing balance to everything and really, we have, and you know, like Michael Jackson said, we got to start with the man in the mirror. Right? Are you are you loving yourself the way that you need to be loving yourself? That's positive, you know. Um, and 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 you know, how you treat yourself is how you treat others. It's right. the golden rule: treat others how you would treat yourself. But the question is, how are you, as treating an individual, yourself. treating yourself? Right. Because right. if you're treating yourself with conditional love, guess what? I'm gonna treat you with conditional love. If I'm treating you with um, judgment, guess well. If I treat myself with judgment, guess how I'm gonna treat you. I'm gonna judge you. Judge I'm gonna you every step of the way, <laughs> and I'm gonna invalidate everything that you do. Right. And I'm always I'm always having an argument. 
I'm always be a headache. Every time you see me, I'll hit this guy go, right? Right. So like, you know, learning, you know, um, so it's all in the method. Forgiveness, it's it's all in the method, you know. So you're putting it all into your work. So let me ask you, brother, you still in contact with Byron Allen? <laughs> Yeah. Um, yes, I am indirectly. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I am. But but I have the the reason I, why I'm back in the South because I want I'm a king. I feel like I want to do it myself. Now I'm not. Um, I am in contact with him, and uh, he's still a person that I can reach out uh, to uh, to help um, uh, uh, bring this vision into fruition. Uh, but it's taken. I'm using my intuition, and you know. And um, uh, when I reach out to him, I had an intuition to reach out to him today. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why, but I'm gonna follow on. I'm gonna follow up on that um, intuitive intuitive thought. Um, but um, I, I'm good at networking, and um, I've been offered two million dollars to build a studio here in Alabama. Uh, yeah. And so, um, but I'm not depending on that money. Uh, the money hasn't come in yet. But I'm just I'm still working on developing the money, my, raising the funds myself. So when I have this studio, I know how to build it. I know what I know what I'm what I'm looking for. I know how I want it to look. So I'm gonna have an empire to where I'm putting out television shows that and, and that incorporate uh, messages of love, learning how to love yourself. You remember like the show Rock? Yeah, yeah, rock, yeah, rock. yeah, yeah. I used yeah, yeah. love it. All shucks. Oh, yeah, hey. yeah, yeah. I used to yeah. love watching Rock. He was a right. man. Men, right. we want to see women. They want to see strong, dominant men that really take care of the right. house, and we, we lack that. And I'm with you, uh, uh, Dre, about you know Bill Cosby. How um, uh, I'm not going to look at the dark side. I'm going to look at the positive. It's dark and light to everybody. I have right. no judgment right. of any. <clears throat> um, his his choices in life does not affect me. Mm-hmm. Now, his, um, if I ch- if, if I if I don't allow them to, right? So I could. Only look at the positive if I want to. That's free will. I can look at his line of work, his portfolio of television shows and seeing what he's done. And I can use it as a template to um, incorporate my own shows. From the cartoons, from the Fat Alberts to the uh, It's a Different World to the Cosby Show and showing that family life and showing that stability and balance, you know. It's kind of sad that, you know, uh, I guess we put the flag on him, you know, what society puts a flag on Because Bill Cosby, man. I believe single-handedly changed the perception of Black America yeah. through television. And he was too powerful. He was too powerful and, and, and just for them general, to see. In general, I mean, just you, to see doctors and lawyers on TV that well, was us. That, the that, house. that was definitely one thing. But then when you're looking at him, you know, back in the seventies, doing like you know, Black History yeah, oh, yeah. Is stolen. You know, like telling you Picasso took this picture Fed from up. Black people. You know, what I mean, things like that, like putting out information like that and even in his latter years and i'll be honest with you when he was having his speeches and whatnot and everybody's like, oh bill tripping back in the day you know when he's telling you you know your kids got 300 hundred dollar sneakers but don't have a computer or don't have books and things like that and it's like yeah. back was then, right. people would say oh bill tripping you know he always getting crazy but no he was actually right because now you're seeing this today that's right you know what i mean you're seeing it today when so, i was young i disagreed with him you know what i mean but when i got old i said <laughs> man he was he was on to something yeah, was on you to know something. what i mean it was yeah. on the and, and that's the thing is like when you talk about Bill Cosby, the reason why I mentioned Byron Allen and all this, because like when you see, you know, these guys at one point, you know, Bill Cosby trying to buy NBC, you know, what type of programming was going on. there was going to be something yeah. positive. You know, I'm quite sure Byron Allen's thinking the same way. And even when he has his issues where they're trying to like block him from buying certain networks and things like that, you know what I mean? I always look at it in a sense of like, there's a reason why, these things are, are happening because it's something that they're bringing to the table that, you know, what we see now, you know, the people that are the so-called powers that be don't want that. You know, they're trying to prevent that, I should say, you know, from, from because us. they know the power of filmmaking. They know the power right. of television. Right. right. People are glued to the television. People are glued to their phones. I can create a movie right now. And if it's good enough, people are going to be watching it. Right. And, right. Not, and there is a cause and there's an effect of everything that we do in life. Everything that we do, I can cause something to happen. Well, guess what that cause? It comes with an effect. If I have a positive cause, it's going to come with a positive effect. Mm. So the powers that be know the power of television. Right. They know how powerful it is. It's hard to get away from it. It's entertaining this God mind that we're operating. The God mind. 
But everybody has a God mind, but nobody knows how to use the God mind till it's full of potential. We're learning how to use the God mind till it's full of potential to bring balance Mm -hmm. to everything that we do. If you're going to watch TV, understand that you're overwatching. Understand that we're on our phones too much. Understand. And so, but the people in the television, they they don't care about that. They just want your money. It's all about the money. Money, 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 and money, money. And to control you so that you don't wake up. So if I keep you busy on your phone, you're not talking about, you know, revolution. That's what happens to the Black Panthers, right? Right. It's a different so type of how, job. <laughs> That's what how it is. Do we, how, how do we stop the movement of the Black Panthers? We incorporate drugs. Mm-hmm. That'll slow them down. They'll be more lethargic. They won't move as fast. They won't even think about, you know, they'll just be chilling. Even now, in our own society right now, I think that's another thing that's uh, over... over um marketed to us man you know I, we come like i said come from new york and new york man it's so much weed that's being sold in new york <laughs> like now like you know it's crazy like it's you know on every block and everything like that but I, to me personally i feel like it's personally pushed towards you know yeah. black and black and brown people like crazy you know oh I, i'm glad you mentioned that because on my journey to just higher enlightenment i use i utilize i didn't start um experiment with weed until I was like mid thirties, 35, because I was in the military. I used to get right. drug tested. Right. So I didn't want to lose my benefits. I was like, no, I'm not doing that. Right. What I discovered, I was already on my spiritual journey. I was already at a certain level, but I discovered that the THC, I was, I did my study to educate yourself. Right. The THC awakens who you are. It heightens your senses of who you are at that moment in time that you're taking the THC. So when the THC reacts, um, it's basically, so when I first took a gummy in LA and, and I was like, yo, I said, I'm going to go to the, you know, to the weed store and I'm going to try right. um, these edibles. And what it did, I went home, I made sure I wasn't going to be crazy. I was like, I did my research because I didn't, there was a lot of people in my family, a lot of friends that I knew who were messed up in the head based off, you know, bad weed or whatever. It was so took, yeah, right. Exactly. And so I wanted to do my research and make sure that I was, you know, going at it with an education. So what I discovered was the TAT just enhances where you already are. So if you're nervous, you're fearful, um, and you're violent, it's just going to make you more violent, right. more well, fearful. You know, the funny thing, I, I mean, we had taken this conversation forever, man, but um, what happens okay. is, yeah, good, man, that you got the time. Uh, what I'm, I'm noticing now, you know what I mean? from dealing with these children. I mean, going in the drive through wherever you see these kids at, man, they is so, like, wasted. Like, you just, like, you're looking at them, you're like, bro, like, like, you ain't even right for work, man. Like, you know what I mean? The drive through is going slow because he can't get it right. You know what I mean? Like, we, we living in a, uh, and I'll say this, and I'm not promoting no drug or whatever the case may be. I can say, honestly, during my era with the, Guys, I grew up, I never was a drug person. Man. I did alcohol. Everybody got something. God, please forgive me for doing that. You know, but, but the young, the, the people that I grew up with, like they were at least able to operate. You know what I mean? Like you said, I think promoting that to us is making a generation of lethargic people. You know what I mean? And like, I, I kind of get what you're saying. Cause it's kind of almost like saying if like, if you're lethargic, it's going to make you more lethargic. If you, you know, um, if you're, sharp then you know maybe it might enhance you. is that what you're saying it's, it, yeah exactly what i'm saying that's exactly so when i took the gummy i was already enlightened with like knowledge and so when i took the gummy i was like whoa it brought clarity to the knowledge i was like whoa and it made more sense and it just came like that and i was like oh because i had did it at an intention most people, when they do THC and they're smoking it, ingesting it, eating it, uh, gummies, uh, uh, brownies, uh, cookies, whatever the case may be, um, they do it. They don't have an intention of why they're doing it. I made an intention that when I take this gummy, I'm a, I, I practice spirituality, my, my stuff every day. So I have no choice when I take the gummy. My thoughts are now getting amplified based off the knowledge that I'm learning, that I'm pulling in. Now, I'm not advocating doing what I do. I'm just sharing knowledge. This is what I did, and this is what I discovered. But I also did my research um, and, uh, when I went and took these um, uh, these THC supplements. I uh, understood that with the, with the right knowledge and the right intention, uh, it should. Because um, when I took the gummy, I was paranoid a little bit, but the paranoia went away because I was aware of it. 
But most people that take, you know, um, these, you know, THC or all the drugs, these hallucinogens uh, are not expecting to be paranoid. They're not expecting the the paranoia to, to come from it, and then they lose their mind because they can't make sense of the reality now that they're that they're in. That the THC has now opened them up to a new reality, another reality that they're not ready to deal with consciously and make sense of it. I think that's another issue that we have too, man, is that again, I, I again, we have at no way form am I promoting doing no drugs at right, all. Right. But on the same token, it's like when I look at it now from what it was, you know, again, I wasn't a drug person in the, in the street. I never liked it or anything like that, but I had right. friends that did it. And I think what these kids are doing now is, is a is a high high THC level that's you know out of this roof, man. And they're doing something different. You know, like you know when I came up, you know the dreads and you know the people in New York, they made sure that every they was about the earth. They wanted it straight out the earth. You know what I mean? It's like now they wrapping it in hash. <laughs> you know what I mean? They dipping it in this. And they you know they're doing all that. You know what I mean? Right. It's it's, it's kind of. <laughs> They're, they're they're running from themselves because they can't make sense of the reality that they're current uh, that they're currently in. So, in the person that drinks is just running from problems that they can't make sense of. Yeah, you're right about. So, 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 I have compassion for these young men and women who, who are they're just lost. I was once lost, but now I'm found. Is it amazing grace? Right. I once was found. You know, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Yeah. That's ninety nine percent of the population are lost because in a nine to five driven environment. How do you have time to work on yourself when Sunday, when Monday through Friday, your mind own, uh, belongs to somebody else, right? So by Saturday, you're like, I don't want to do nothing. I don't want to be lazy. I want to drink. Sunday, you got to do it all over again. So when is there time to really to do the self-development work? Otherwise, now you're just in a world filled with entertainment and, and distractions. And now your mind can't think because you know, everything's in your face all, constantly and you never have peace, Right. you know? And that's why I couldn't, I, that's why I said, that's why I can't promote spiritually. I couldn't promote it, you know, cause I never believe in doing anything that's going to take over control of your body, you know? And again, I'm not talking like no high and mighty, holy roller, you know, we did it, things coming up too, you know what I mean? It's your experience. It's, it's your experience. Right. It's your perspective, you know, and you know, everybody either could respect your perspective or not respect it. I had right. to learn how to be okay with nobody um, respecting my perspective. I had to stand in my truth. Um, right. In my in my perspective and what I've been learning, you know, and respect other everybody else's perspective. You know, just see, I, I think the thing that bothers me is just I just see the destruction of our people, man. Like I'm looking at, you know, I, you know, it's sad to say. I mean, because I could, you know, I have to have hope, but on the other side, I'm like, yo, like these kids is not operating right, man. You know what I mean? Like I just see, like it's just like the the entertainment, the the drugs, the you know, so on and so forth, man. It's hard to even raise a child. I, I sympathize with anybody got to raise a child in this this day and age. You got to send them to school. Your morals and religious principles are being, you know, forced out. You know, I mean, it's just a lot of stuff that's going on. And uh, I mean, we could talk about that forever. But, you know, again, it's just like uh, I couldn't promote anything that's going to um, that I think is going to hurt our people. You know what I mean? I understand. Or any understand. people for that matter. You know what I mean? But uh I'm Again, it's, it's a it's a it's a tough time we live in now, you know. Because I'm just I'm just yeah. seeing th- the things that I'm seeing in life, walking around, driving, and stuff like that. My passion now is like, come on, man! I can't. We can't do this. Like I remember rap music. I used to, I love rap music growing up. You know what I mean? Now I listen God to Quest. I love it. So oh, I love it. I, love we'll it. I still <laughs> I still I still have it in my system. You know what yeah. I mean? I still you know have that love for it in my system. But on the same token, now I could look back. I'm like, yo, man, this dude was talking crazy, man. This is. Um, um, you know, I, I, I'm, we're going all over in this conversation. I remember years ago, man, listening to MOP. And I was with a bunch of guys. And I'm telling you, MOP, I don't know if you know from your area, MOP is like um, real hardcore hip hop music. And I was thinking to myself, like, you know, when you get in the car and you got that kind of energy behind you, that negative hardcore energy behind you, you can't tell me it doesn't put you in the 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 mental state of doing something the wrong way, you know what I mean? And it does, man, you know what I mean? So, you know, so then I had to come as an adult now when I deal with um, talking to children and the, the sex, the sexy reds and 
you know, these different kind of artists in the music. I'm like, yo, man, y'all, we're driving these kids the wrong way. Like, and I think what you said earlier, the Tribe Called Quest and whatever, in some ways there was a balance in it. You know what I mean? Because Tribe Called Quest made you want to read something. You know, Lauren Hill and them made you want to go pick up a book. And, you know, I heard Miseducation and Lauren Hill. And I said, oh, where she get that from? Miseducation and Sonny Carson. It makes you go want to investigate things. This stuff right now is so stupid and Candy Apple is ridiculous, man. You know, this is my soapbox, man. I don't want to get want to go <laughs> no, too crazy, no. man. Yeah. No, 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 no. Speak, speak from your heart. You know, yeah. I hear you and I sympathize with you, and um, but, but I just know we just have to keep on pushing through repetition and consistency. Right, right, yeah, right, yeah. right. And 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 being and being the light. I know I'm a light worker, and I know I got a lot of work to do. I've dedicated my life to this. I will be doing this until I have no more breath, until I choose to leave, or in a tragic action. A tragic accident takes me out or whatever the case, but I, this is my calling. And so I know that I'm going to do great. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do great in what I do because that I'm, I'm not giving myself room for failure in this process. Um, so I, I see the light at one point in time. I didn't see the light um, in, in hope for humanity and our culture is black men and black women. Uh, but I do see it. And, I, and I'm happy. That's why I keep smiling because the pendulum must swing to the dark for a little bit and it must go to the right. So now it's time for the light to take over. And we're in the year of Aquarius. I don't know if you believe in astrology, but um, I'm an Aquarius. And mm. so I, I feel a great service and we are humanitarians. And um, so I feel a great service. And there are other light workers like you, like, like yourselves, who are helping put out the message um, and in having guests like myself who have a positive message to reach, uh, not just our culture, but the entire world. Because you know one thing, that it is the Black culture that's going to take this whole entire world to new heights. Because everything that we do here in America, the world is watching. Everything from our music, how we dance, whatever we talk about, reality TV, we set the bar majority for the world. Everybody wants to be like this black male. The one positive thing I want to say about our children now, man, is, you know, um, one thing that I, I you, you can't say about them. They're about getting to the bag. They're about getting to that money. You know what I mean? The only problem I have is sometimes is that, you know, they don't care how to get to the money, but they're about, they're about getting to the money. And um, as far as like um, the information, man, like they will Google something in a minute and, you know, you can't you can't bull crap them. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you, you know, like you, they know they can get in history and they could uh, come back at you and fire back at you immediately, you know, with certain things. So I wanted to give a positive, you know, in the sense that, you know, they, they got some good things going on. You know, I'm not saying that they don't, it's all bad or anything like that, but uh, you know, I, I, I just, I I'm just giving, you. giving a, you know, what I, what I see so far, man, you know, maybe I'm an old man. Now. Maybe I'm looking at things differently. <laughs> it, hey, no, 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 no. It's, it's your perspective. You're living in, uh, in New York and you're looking at the society of where you live. I can talk about this, the society where I'm at right now, currently in Alabama. I could talk about the society where I was in, in Los Angeles. Uh, so, and what I see in the landscape and, you know, and thinking and, you know, uh, so uh, you're just speaking your perspective. It's neither right nor wrong. It's right, right. for you. It's, right. Your, it's, it's your lens that you're seeing the world out of. Right. You know? And I respect it. And I respect it 100%. And definitely. I, yeah, definitely. Well, brother, we thank you for being on. And before, you know, we let you go, for real, we can carry this conversation on, you know, save some of it for when we have you back. How about that? <laughs> we have you back on. You know what I mean? It's like it's like it's like sitting on a stoop. Yeah, it's like this is stoop talk. Sitting right? on a stoop. Yeah, yeah. we just yeah. chilling. You just know chilling. what I'm saying? B boy style. You know what I'm saying? Just Spike Lee joint. You right. know what I'm saying? That's uh, what it is. Like so this camera action. We just sitting there chilling. You know? Right, right. So why don't you give the people your handles, like where they can reach you at, how they can support this work that you're doing, and all? Um, go ahead and speak to the audience. At this moment in time, yeah, you can reach me on my, at my website. It's brianisomconsulting.com. And that's spelled B-R-I-A-N, Brian Isom, I-S-O-M as in Mary, consulting.com. And there is where I have my, my TV projects. Uh, my, um, uh, you get a, a book a session um, uh, with me. Uh, and, uh, and my IG handle 
uh, is a black Buddha. Now, I only have one picture. I'm getting back into the swing of things because I had to reinvent myself and be more methodic about how I present myself to the world. Because obviously, you know, uh, people want to check out your social and they will judge you mm-hmm. based on what your social. They'll, they'll validate you or, <laughs> or uh, invalidate you based off uh, what you put on there. So I have to be mindful. Mm-hmm. And so as I'm building my uh, Instagram page, it's uh, Black Buddha, B L A K Buddha, B U D D H A, the number nine. Okay. And I wanted to mention this too because uh, I know you were talking about your projects. And I hear you working on the uh, photography for uh, shoes, Russell. Yes. Anthony, good brother, Russell. Yes. So yes. Right on the show. Um, good brother. Yeah. Good brother. Yes. 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 Uh, uh, Chris. Um, uh, brought us together. Uh, Chris is a is a she's you know she's the glue that's bringing a lot of things together, and I I, I want to wish her nothing but love uh, because uh, without her I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you guys. Yeah, um, if if it, if it wasn't for her um, putting this together, uh, so uh, Chris Jordan is is a powerhouse and a wonderful person in my life. Uh, yeah, so that's cool. how me and Russell Andrews uh, became connected. I, I would See, like to I have you and Russell could... on here together, man. I would be. I didn't mean to cut you off straight, but I, I would like to have you and Russell on here together, man. You know what I mean? Okay. And we, you know, sit down to chop it up. This is a good brother. Man. Yeah. I could see how you guys get along, man, because you look, you seem like a younger version of him, man. Like, you know, <laughs> and, and, and then like the conversation, a, yeah. the conversation to us very similar. You know what I mean? So yeah, he's, yeah. and he's oh, a good wow. brother, man. Very yeah, good brother. Very man, good you know? brother, man. Thank you for that compliment. Yeah. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Definitely. So, again, don't be a stranger. You know what I mean? You definitely have a spot on the show, man. And kind of want to come back and, you know, just chop it up like this, man. <laughs> just chop it yeah. up like this. Yeah. All right. So, listen, I'm going to give our handles, too. You know what I mean? So, we really appreciate your time, Brian. So, just hang over for a minute as you can. All right, y'all. The Only One Mic Podcast is available on all man, all platforms you stream your podcast on. Also, check out our Only One Mic Podcast YouTube channel to catch up on the past and current episodes. Please don't forget to rate the show and subscribe. You can check us out on Instagram and X slash Twitter at The Only One Mic P1, Facebook and LinkedIn at The Only One Mic Podcast. You can contact us via email at theonlyonemic 0 at gmail.com or call us at 302-367-7219 to have your comments and questions played on the show. We thank you all once again for your time. The audience, thank you for making space. Brian, thank you for making space. And we encourage you, please, to speak the truth quietly and clearly and listen to others, even the dull and the ignorant, because they, too, have their story to tell. So until next time, please keep in mind that if you each one teach one, and if you can't find one, you talk to the little ones, and you'll see that they'll feel the missing piece to rise and shine. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. Brian, thank you once again. That's right. And to that, we say peace. Peace.